You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 10 through 18. It says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you are baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You now can pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. I pray that because of me, or even in spite of me, this morning your word would be faithfully proclaimed. Amen. So you know that joke people always make about how the three certainties in life are death, change, and taxes? Well, I think they forgot to add conflict to that list, because I've never been, a place, been in a place with more than a single individual that didn't have some sort of conflict. I mean, even in a place with just one person, there can be conflict due to the internal strife and conflict that can arise in our lives from time to time. And the church is no exception of conflict. Um, in fact, sometimes I wonder if we might be one of the worst places when it comes to the persistent presence of conflict. There can be church conflict that extends for generations. We've all probably heard stories about how 18 years ago, so-and-so did something to make someone mad, and you still remember it. Like, I've heard the stories over the years in ministry. I've probably heard stories from the church I grew up in. There are probably still conflicts going that there might not even be living family members left, but there are people who heard the story about what happened. And not even the early church was immune to the persistent presence of conflict. And we hear that in the scripture that we read this morning. And our passage is from the early portion of one of Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. Um, and even from this small excerpt we read, we see one of the main purposes of the whole letter. Paul is appealing to the Corinthians in the name of Jesus that they be united in the same mind and same purpose. In place of divisions, Paul is calling for them to be in agreement with one another. And in the second verse, we learn that Paul is making this appeal because Chloe's people have reported quarrels among them. And leadership was at the heart of this conflict. So evidently, the people within the church were becoming divided by what leader they claimed. People would say things, like in the scripture, they said, I belong to Cephas, or Paul, or Apollos, or Christ. A modern equivalent of this might be someone over-identifying with a pastor or church leader, or perhaps even a denomination. Because as followers of Christ, it's less important who our pastoral leader is at the moment, or what denomination we're a part of. What truly matters that, is that we are followers of Jesus. Our belief in the triune God unites us with believers across any number of differences. But even in biblical days, when life was arguably much simpler, they still dealt with divisions and conflicts over these issues. Although before I dive more deeply into the conflict and the constructive feedback that Paul is giving to the Corinthians, I want to look at this from their point of view. The people in the church at Corinth were testifying to the missionary work that people like Paul, Apollos, and Cephas had done in their midst. In some ways, it makes sense that the Corinthians were telling people about Paul, Apollos, 
and Cephas, how they dramatically changed their lives through their teaching and preaching. Of course, that the true transformative power of what was happening was really due to Jesus' power and presence in their midst. The power of the risen Christ was making lives new and bringing healing and vitality to communities in Corinth and around the biblical world. To some extent, the people at Corinth were just proud of Paul, Apollos, and Cephas and how they had helped to establish and strengthen their new community of faith. It's similar to how people in the church nowadays will sing praises of different pastors or teachers or preachers. I know I'm the person and pastor I am today because of the influence of various pastors, teachers, and mentors throughout my own life. I also know that I've heard many stories from you all of sharing about how teachings of people like Billy Graham or Charles Stanley or Max Licato or any number of other people, how their, their teaching has shaped your journey of faith. That's essentially what the Corinthians were doing. The problem developed then when they began to let this gratitude become a source of division in their midst. And so often that's the case. Something starts out as a good thing, or at least as a neutral thing, and then it begins, begins to take up too much space in our heart and mind. Anything can become an idol when it becomes an object, an object of our worship. Or in less churchy terms, anything can become an idol when it becomes something we can't live without, when it becomes an object of our affection, when it comes, becomes too much of our attention or our focus. Similarly, anything can become a source of conflict or division when we elevate it to a level of importance that was, it was never created or designed to have. I see that as what was happening in the Corinthian church as Paul is addressing them. They're having quarrels and divisions because they're placing their church leaders on pedestals. They're letting church leaders become a source of identity, even, rather than remembering what truly unites them as a community of faith. That's why Paul goes into that string of rhetorical questions about whether the Corinthians were baptized in the name of Paul, whether Paul was crucified for them. And as I thought about it, I had to think back to who was writing, because I was like, wait, he's talking about himself in the third person here. And he is. He's saying, like, is Paul crucified for you? Did were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer to these rhetorical questions was, of course not. Of course, Paul was not the one they were claiming faith in. Even when someone does perform a baptism, the emphasis is never supposed to be placed on that person. After all, the power of baptism comes from God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The person performing the baptism is just an instrument being used by God to help someone receive that gift of grace. No one is baptized in the name of Paul. They're baptized in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're called and named as a child of God, given the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was true in biblical days. It continues to be true today. Like The focus of baptism is never supposed to be on the person performing it. It's on what God is doing through that sacrament. And I actually believe the covenant that we share at our baptism is a profound source of unity for people of faith. The liturgy of our baptismal service, um, we have a couple different ones if you look in our hymnal, and even more if you look in our book of worship. Um, but the liturgy for our baptismal covenant services might be some of my favorite parts of our denominational heritage. Throughout our liturgy, there's a renunciation of all that's evil and a profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. This is woven throughout the entirety of the service of baptism, which is also used when people join the church. It's not just baptism, but it, it extends beyond that too. These commitments bind us together as children of God and people of faith. We would do well, both as individuals and as a church community, to come back to these baptismal vows because they outline who God has called us to be. 
As people of faith, we commit to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sins. Just that first baptismal vow, and there's so much covered, renouncing spiritual wickedness, rejecting evil, and repenting of sins. Like, each of those topics, you could probably spend multiple sermons or weeks or months studying those notions. Perhaps an entire life of faith thinking about how we live into that. But that's just one of the baptismal vows. As people of faith, we also commit to accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. As people of faith, we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior. We put our whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. These baptismal vows are profoundly meaningful, and there's so much richness in them. Like, even as I read them, there's so many details, so many pieces of them that you could dive more deeply into. And any time there's a baptism or confirmation, or often even when people join the church, we all reaffirm these vows, both our rejection of sin and our commitment to Christ. So I can think of no better way to live out Paul's appeal to be united in the same mind and the same purpose than to keep these baptismal vows central to our shared life together. After all, our baptismal covenant covers being of one mind and of one purpose. Being of the same mind can cover a lot, but at its core, it's about having a shared belief in the triune God. We're of one mind when we agree about who God is and all that Christ has done for us. We're of one mind when we focus on how Christ's saving work on the cross unites all of creation. Instead of focusing on the different disagreements or differences that we have with others, we choose to focus on the essentials that unite us as children of God, who are created in the image of God. It's like that famous quote, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. The gospel message of the unearned, unmerited, undeserved love of God that we experience in Jesus Christ, that's one of the essentials. And as Paul notes, Christ cannot be divided. So when we belong to Christ, we belong to one another. That's why Paul even listed, I belong to Christ in that list. Like, if you think about that list, it's sort of curious. It's like, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, and then I belong to Christ. And you're like, wait, that one's not like the other ones. Wasn't that one okay? But the reason Paul listed, I belong to Christ, in the problematic statements the Corinthians were making is because when we put our faith in Christ, we're supposed to let go of that insular, solitary mindset. We embrace the collective good instead of focusing simply on our individual desires. It's not supposed to be, I belong to Christ, even if that's a true statement. It's supposed to be, we belong to Christ. As the beloved hymn goes, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our, merch, our mutual burdens bear. Perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. The love and grace of God is what binds us all together in Christian love. Because of the cross of Christ, we are united with one another for all eternity. When we belong to Christ, we belong to one another. And I, as I think about this, it's not just about us here in Hopewell United Methodist. It's not just us in the United Methodist Church. It's not in any singular denomination. Just as children of God, as people, we are united with one another through God's love. I've always found that something I appreciate about, like, denominational differences. There are a lot of things I don't agree with with other denominations. There's a reason I found myself here and that's true of everyone, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Baptist, uh, Pentecostal, like 
The list is long of denominations in the world, and we have our disagreements. We think differently about how to baptize, how to do communion, any number of other things, but we agree on the essential. We believe in the triune God. We believe in what Christ has done on the cross for us. So it's okay if someone finds a home in a different denomination because it's still growing the kingdom of God. We're still all going to be together in eternity, no matter what denomination we've been in here. As long as we believe in God, ultimately we're still united as children of God. The kingdom of God is still growing, regardless of what small church community we found a home in. And to me, that's a, a great gift in our family of faith. Those holy ties that come from God's love, they enable us to be united in the same mind and the same perfect purpose. The love that we find and come to know in Christ is where we come to find and know our purpose as well. Because our purpose is to proclaim the hope and life that we have found in Christ so that all might come to know the power and love of God. Our purpose is to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Our purpose is to proclaim the gospel and the message about the cross. Because to those who are being saved, it is the very power of God. So may we indeed be united by this same mind and purpose. May there be no divisions among us because Christ cannot be divided. We belong to Christ, and because we belong to Christ, we belong to one another. May it be so until perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.